This is Life Questions, a program that looks deep and wide in the Word of God for answers to your many questions about life. I'm Bill Harris, your host. You know, life is quite interesting in what some older seasoned Christians call these last and evil days. Such things as the global pandemic, climate change, and political unrest have become life-changing events. And what does the Word of God have to say about all these matters and the many questions that our viewers are sending in and have written us about? Well, today we will take a good look at this with a group of local ministers that we have invited to research these matters and provide us with some biblical insights. And they're here right now to answer your questions. I'd like to introduce you to them. They are Pastor Jeff Kimberly of Neapolis Church of Christ, Pastor Chris Langstaff of Bell Center Church of Christ, Pastor Tim Benjamin of Wayne Street United Methodist in um, St. Mary's, and Pastor Randy Davis of The Bridge right here in Lima area. Gentlemen, we're happy to have you with us for Thanks another round. Glad to be here. Enjoyed our discussions with you last week. And uh, as we continue, uh, the first question I would like to bring up, one of our viewers writes, my brother attends a church where the pastor says the Bible might not be true. And it's just a bunch of stories to cause people to think about life. I don't know how to talk with my brother because he's very influenced by this pastor. So first of all, before we get to his major question of how does he handle this with his own brother? Um, but first of all, I want to know why would a pastor say the Bible may not be true and he still wants to call himself a pastor it's kind of a it's kind of a, a cheap shot really because uh the bible the bible is a faith document and uh you know it's a it's thousands of years old mm -hmm. in some parts even older than that and uh so you know i don't know about any of you guys i wasn't around then to verify any of it <laughs> uh so to say it's true or, or not true in a historical context it's, a, it's you have to take it on faith because there is no more evidence than what's on the page. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, so for the pastor to call that into question, I'm not sure what in the world point she or he was trying to make with that. Yeah. So, yeah I, yeah, I just question what kind of church it was. Yeah. Obviously, I mean, if you don't have the Bible as your your yeah, your, what do you left with? God, what are you, what are you doing? So, mm -hmm. I, and you know, and then I can also see where you know, a pastor could use it as a teaching point. You know, making it, you know might not be true trying to help them understand you need to prove it you need to make this true I, you know i see it as a point but this is obviously some kind of a lifestyle thing where they're just having a conversations and and i don't see it much as of a church but mm -hmm. i think there's a bigger context she's going to have to get through first to yeah. Yeah. But, but you know, this is spread beyond just pastors i mean even on some university christian university campuses <laughs> you've got some professors that are re really casting doubt on the Absolutely. word of god as well yeah mm -hmm. Have you any of you experienced that? Not personally, but you know, I, I just want to point them back to Second Timothy chapter three. You know, all Scripture is God breathed. It come, it came from God. I don't know what yes. other, how else you can prove that it's true mm -hmm. than not using that verse of Scripture. Okay, it came from God. Uh, you know, well, it may not be true. Um, okay, prove it. <laughs> and, and the fact that it came from God, uh, the fact that it came from God, uh, gives it gives it a, an element of truth that no other document has. Yeah. And uh, and I think and, and so was there ever a Jonah? Was there ever a Nehemiah? Well, we have to say probably at least. We le know there was least. a Noah. Yeah. I mean, we we have we have to say probably at least because to to just go ahead and cut the legs out of all those stories takes all their meaning away from them. Yeah. You know. Uh, you know. No one was around. I wasn't riding on the ark, but. I'm willing to take that on faith because there's so many good lessons in there to yeah. help us. Well, I, I don't think anybody around this table was in the room when they signed the Declaration of Independence. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't know for we didn't see what started World War One. We there are a lot of things that we take as true, even though we weren't there to actually see them happen. Mm -hmm. Uh, I, I don't think there's any document in existence today that has been uh, scrutinized, analyzed, and and literally torn apart to see if it's accurate. Then the Bible. It's an excellent point. And this, the scriptures were written by people that were actually there. And, and yes, it was inspired by the Holy Spirit. That's that's the cherry on top, mm -hmm. I guess, if you will. Um, that 
that that we we take a lot of things for granted uh, because we know that people that were there actually witnessed these events and they reported these events. Why do we want to give the Bible any less credence in any any less authority? Yeah. Okay. Um, and, and Bill, I think you know I, one of my first papers that I had to do at Bible college was the proof text of Scripture, and I grew up in the church. But I don't think there's a kid alive that didn't grow up in the church that didn't sit in a pew sometimes and goes, is this real? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so I was very curious to prove this. I, I mean, I was, this inquiring mind wanted to know, where did all this come from? You know, how do we know it's true? And so it was probably the only time I spent that much time in a library the whole time I was in school. But I remember my summation statement that my professor used at the end of all, grading all of them. It was, if you, if you lived or read the Bible, and you lived according to its principles and precepts, and you died and there was no God, would your life have been better off or worse off? Because to me, even if it wasn't true, it gives you the, the, the formula for a good life. And you're a good person. If you follow the Ten Commandments and you do all the do's and don'ts, and you're going to have a way better life than the person who just lives life unto themselves. And then the second part of that summation statement was, but if you don't take it as truth and you live your life according to yourself and you die and find out it is true, Will your life be better or worse off? Yeah. You know, and so that was just something that I came up with in my in my research that said, man, it's it's there's a lot of reason to follow this book. Yeah. There's there's some good yeah. stuff in here. Absolutely, yeah. I've told my I've told my congregation, two or three maybe five times, that bi the Bible literally stands for basic instructions before leaving Earth. Yeah. You want to live? Yeah. This is how you do it. Yeah. You want to live a good life? This is how you do it, and. It's it's that simple. And like you said, better or worse. Well, if you follow what it says, your life is going to be better. If you want to do it your way, okay, you let me know how that worked out for you. It's going to have consequences. As, as you were talking, I was reminded of, of Lee Strobel's famous book, The Case for Christ. He set out to disprove Christianity, and, and he looked at all the evidence, and at the end of it, he ex, he, he came into faith in, in Christ yes. and, and has, has done Dow amazing. The same thing. Exactly <laughs> right. Yeah. I mean, that, that doesn't happen by accident. Yeah. Uh, and, and another thing, just uh, to kind of further this point, um, there are a lot of people in history that have died because of what's in this book. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You can't convince me that, I mean, if it came down to me, I'm not gonna die for a lie. I'm not gonna die for a story. I mean, you look at, at, at 11 of the 12 apostles, John, we think, died of old age. The other 11 apostles were martyred for their faith. There's something to this. Mm -hmm. And... You know, we're, we're studying John. Our Wednesday night group is studying the book of John. And we were in John chapter six, two weeks ago, and I, we're talking about Capernaum, and I said, if you go to Capernaum, you can see archaeological evidence where they found a 5th century church, where they found a 4th century church, where they found the home that Peter lived in. You tell me that it, five centuries, you tell me it doesn't, you tell me that people mentioned in the Bible aren't, aren't true. Yeah, and I, I think that if you just go on basic principles of what it means to you in your own Christian life, I've tried the Bible. I started at 15, and I've tried the Bible, and it works. Amen. You know, yep. it, it, it works for me. It, it has reformed my life. Absolutely. And um, I have an intimacy with the Lord. I was saying to a group this morning when we were taping some other shows, God is a God of the universe. He's, he's very busy with the whole universe, but he cares enough to fill your cup. Mm. That is to say, you know, David said, you, you know, you, 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 my cup runneth over. Mm -hmm. So we should all be drinking out of a saucer because our cup runs over. Despite the fact that he's a God of the universe, he can become so personal that he deals with you on the basis of your individuality. Yep. That's yep. He knows the hairs on our head. Yeah, yeah, part, break your point. Not, not many. Not many. <laughs> not many. <laughs> not many. <laughs> our head, but. but Ever decreasing general. number. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but in any event, I, I, I am concerned, as I said earlier, even on the Christian college campuses, there are some professors that have gone that route, and even though you say that you may not have experienced that, we've we received There's reports of that. some very popular that. TV pastors that have kind of swayed the gospel and the doctrine too, and, and you know, because they're so popular and they're so, they become kind of an authority, and for those guys, I would say, man, I hope they get it straightened out because 
you know, the judgment that would await that is going to yeah. be tough. Yeah. Um, and I don't think they mean to. I think they just kind of get caught up in stuff. They listen to their own people and, uh, you know, they, they, I don't know. But it's like, come on, man, you got to you gotta preach the scripture. You can't just preach your, your good, you know, whatever it is. But uh, well, there are scriptures that say that, that Satan has blinded the minds of the non-believers yeah. at least so that they, they, they can't see. But it also says that in the last days there will be a great falling away of those who are believers. It also says that there will be a time when they will give to men what their itching ears want to mm -hmm. hear. Mm -hmm. and That's going on. Refuse to listen to sound doctrine. Yeah, yeah. And, and so some of these TV pastors, some of these, I hate to say it this way, mega church pastors, they're so popular because it's, it's, they're itching their ears. They're not, they're not, maybe not preaching the gospel, but you know, hey, my ears are being itched, so mm -hmm. I'll, I'll come, I'll come mm -hmm. listen to you another one, one of our dogs likes to have his ears scratched, and, and whenever that happens, you know, the eyes kind of roll back and kind of glaze over, and yeah. I think that's what happens to a lot of people in some of our churches today. Um, Interesting it, analogy. Yeah, I mean, it, and it, once that happens, once a, once a pastor becomes intent on, well, I, I'm, I'm going to stay away from this passage because I don't want to offend anybody. Mm -hmm. uh, it's controversial. I don't want to go there. That It's a slippery slope that unfortunately, because I think like, like you mentioned, that the, uh, the Bible is, is losing its authority in, in some churches. Mm -hmm. Uh, I, I think that's a, that's a recipe for disaster. Absolutely. And, and in, in the world of academics, because I went a little bit further, I, I got my bachelor's and I went on to get my master's degree. Um, and theologians have to say something shocking. Uh, they, they have to take up a contrary position. I mean, if you, if you get a table full of commentaries mm -hmm. over uh, the book of John, chances are they're all going to say different things. They're all going to try, because you, you can only... The, the word says what it says. Sure. You, you can only take it so many ways, but that's where theologians get a name for themselves. They say something radical or they say something revolutionary, and then pretty soon those ears start getting scratched. You know, mm -hmm. well, you mean the Bible really says, and so there's a lot of knowledge, there's a lot of things to, to look at, which maybe we'll get to here in a little bit as far as studying the Bible and studying scriptures. Uh, but there's also a lot of things out there that if you're not careful, they'll, they'll take you away from what God's Word says. Yeah. Back, in the, back in the mid and late 90s when I was in college and seminary, one of the big things going around was the Jesus Seminar. I don't know if, mm -hmm. you, know, if any of you remember sure. that. But what they found was is they voted with marbles. So they would just take a passage of Scripture and you put in certain colors, say absolutely true, probably true, maybe not true, and then definitely didn't happen. And, and so they started releasing some of their... Um, uh, findings or votings, I guess, and uh, they started to realize that they got a whole lot more uh, sales when they found controversial stuff, exactly what you were saying. Yeah. Yeah. So, they, they, so they started to err on the side of, well, no, we're going to print it all and, and, and as untrue, and suddenly everybody's all fired up and buying the books. Sure. And, and you're right, controversy sells. There's no question about it. And I would almost bet that's what's going on with this person is controversy sells. And look, I'm not going to say that I've never said something controversial to see if I get a rise of somebody. I mean, I do that all the time. But, but I, I, you know, the times I've done it, I, I want the person to come back and, and learn from that. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, I would never stand in the pulpit and say this isn't true or didn't happen. What am I trying to prove there? Now, in a right. Bible study, I might push somebody on that just to see where it will go. Mm -hmm. But I would never stand in the pulpit and say that. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I don't believe it myself. So, okay. yeah. Well, it's time to take a break, and uh, we're going to come back with some more good discussion. And uh, we ask you in our audience to stay with us. We'll be back right after this. Don't go away. There's still a lot more discussion to come on this episode of Life Questions. But first, do you have a question for a future show? Email it to lifequestions at WTLW.com or call us 419-339-4444. You can also suggest pastures you feel would be a good fit for our panel. Again, send your question ideas and pastor suggestions to lifequestions at WTLW.com. Now, back to the discussion. All right, so thank, you, thank you for sticking with us, and we are back. And uh, some good information coming from uh, Pastor Randy here about apps, about the Bible. What do you have to say? What, what are your resources like? I think, you know, before, before you talk about the app, 
I think the apps are an easy to use way to encourage people to read God's word. As a pastor uh, of the same church for 14 years, I compelled our people, even as a youth pastor, I compelled people to read through the Bible every year. Mm -hmm. I think that's a bare minimum for a Christian to at least read through the Bible. And I would always get judged by the super spirituals. Well, why don't you tell them to study it? My thought was, if they ain't reading it, they're probably not studying it. So let's start with reading it. But I would get, I would, I can't tell you the pushback I would get from people in church. Many of them seasoned church people. You know, so I didn't say seasoned Christians. Yeah. Because they would, one lady says, why do you make it your uh, uh, objective to make me feel guilty that I don't read the Bible? Wow. And I was like, now this lady grew up in the church. She grew up in, 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 in a leader of the church's home and, and that was her pushback. And she did it many times. Wow. And, and that, that's what I said. So there's, the first, there's got to be a hunger for God's word. The app won't do you any good if you don't use it. True. Okay? So if you've got a hunger for God's Word and you've got a smartphone, you can do the Version app. It's Y-O-U, capital V, E-R-S-I-O-N. Download it. The best part about it is it's got almost every translation of the Bible in there. So people say, why don't you carry your Bible? I do. i got 36 translations. I don't even know how many proof text uh, commentaries that are in the app. And then a bazillion, and I'm not even exaggerating, I think there's probably a bazillion different devotionals for any topic you can oh, come yeah. up with. Yeah. So if you're having trouble in your marriage, you click on it and it'll give you 13 different things to read. Most of them are three to seven days. Yeah. Right. You read it, it gives you scripture to study. And I think it creates a hunger for God's word more than just reading through it, but you gotta start reading through it. And then there's all kinds of uh, read through the Bible in a year, uh, mm -hmm. things to follow. Reading and the cool thing on here is, is when you're done, it clicks. And then it says you're up to date or, hey, you're two days behind. So it makes it easier for people to say, I'm going to do this. Mm -hmm. Now, because I had that agenda and I still have that agenda, it's occurred people to read. Just two weeks ago, I'm in a park in Lima talking to a former parishioner. And he goes, I want to tell you a story. Okay. He says, you know how you always pounded on us to read the Bible? And I'm thinking, here we go, you know, around 25,000. Know, somebody's going to beat me up again. And I'm thinking, I'm, I'm a pastor. It's my goal was to get you in God's word because don't take my word for it. Find out for yourself, you know. Yeah. Well, anyway, he says, I had a problem and I was too embarrassed to tell you. I can't read. Hmm. Oh. And I was like, whoa. Now the app does have where we'll read it to you and you can follow along. He it's said, I voice you mean? Yeah, though, actually, it's, it's verbal. I, I, that's what I do. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. So I literally hit the listen button and I follow along and it scrolls up for me while I do. Wow. He said, that was okay for me, but I, I still didn't know how to read. But he said, just this last year, when we started talking about programs again and reading through the Bible, he said, God said, I want you to read a children's Bible. And he said, for the first time in my life, and tears ran down his face. I'm finally understanding God's word. Wow. wow. And it challenged me. As I, I share yeah. it to you guys because awesome. it hit me that, you know, there's a lot of people that can't read. The sure. literacy rate oh, yeah. amongst adults is pretty, you know, there's it's, a lot of people can't read. Yeah. Right. And I thought, wow. And he said, I just thought I'd share that with you. And thanks for not ever giving up on me and pressing me to read oh, the Bible. Yeah. Gave me a big hug. But, but it, it gave me a new option to say, hey, wow, you know, there may be some guys in our church that need to read a Bible, a kid's Bible. You know, when you, so, wow. when, when us as pastors, when we come into a new congregation, you always kind of take the temperature of the church, right? Where are they, where are they spiritually? What, where, where would you say they are? When I came to Neapolis just about two years ago, I, took, I did that, kind of took the temperature. And I, real, I, I realized that they were very shallow. Not many of them knew, you know. So one of my very first sermons, I said, go ahead, turn in your Bibles to the story of Noah and the ark. It might even have been a Wednesday night Bible study. And I had this lady. It was a Wednesday night Bible study. The lady raises her hand. She goes, what book's that in? I was like, okay, there's no hunger here for the Word of God. So fast forward about six months. I'm up in the pulpit. And I'm talking about, we were preaching through the book of 1 Timothy. And I made the point of reading God's Word. And I said, how many of you have read through the Bible in your life? And I think maybe three hands went up. I said, how many of you have read through half the Bible. No, no, no more hands went up. And I thought, okay. So I've already kind of started 22, thinking about 22. 
And I, our, we always have a church theme. And so this year our theme was Disciples Making Disciples. I think next year is going to be Students of the Word. And, and, and push what you said, is getting into your Bible, reading it, and making right. it important. You know, and, 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 and for me, uh, in my devotion, personally, you know, I, I take and I read a section of Scripture right now, I'm reading through the book of Galatians. I always read a proverb, because there's 31 proverbs, you can read a proverb a day, and then I always open up our daily bread, or your daily bread, and I read the devotion for that day. That's my, that's my quiet time, I do it at the church, mm-hmm. and I get there in the morning. Um, because my house is not anywhere near quiet, <laughs> ever. And uh, it's, so, you know, maybe pick up a little devotional Bible. You can get them at your church. You know, a little devotion book. You can get them at your church. Many churches have them. Pick that up. Go, and if that doesn't help you, you know, a lot of our churches now have, you know, apps that you can download on your phone. You can listen to the preacher's sermons. Do that. Yeah. You know? Well, thank you. Listen, I want to move on to another subject here while we still have time. Uh, this question from a viewer there are a few things I don't understand at all about the Bible. Why would humanity be held responsible for two people eating fruit? And I want you to understand this question is asked by an atheist. Mm-hmm. Why, would any, why, why would God hold people responsible? Because it was really good mm-hmm. fruit. <laughs> I, I get the question. The, the question is a very, very valid question, but it, it's a little bit misguided. Uh, there, there's more going on here than just the two people, obviously Adam and Eve. There, mm-hmm. There's more going on than just simply eating a piece of fruit. Um, after creation, God gave Adam and Eve one rule. There's two trees in the Garden of right, Eden. Right. One, don't, don't eat from its fruit. You don't want to go there. They had one rule and they broke it. Mm-hmm. That's the, the bigger story. <laughs> and, and I understand this person's question, but it's a bit misguided. The, the problem is God said don't, but Adam and Eve did. And that is the beginning of where we are today. Yeah. Some of the things that, that we've talked about uh, here are a result of that one act of disobedience. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, so the question, and it's a great question, it's a, it's a it fantastic is. question, and it's something that we could probably riff on for <laughs> two or three hours, but, but the, the, the back story is the disobedience. Okay. One rule, they broke it. Anybody else want to chime in on that? I think he covered it. I was going to say, he, he, hit, he hit that nail yeah. on the head. Mm-hmm. Could you speak to how, because of their sin, it affects all of humanity? Well, you know, when, when, I was, when I was driving over here today, I had to drive about a half an hour to get here. And uh, every, every, I don't know, a couple of miles, there was this sign that told me how fast I was allowed to drive. I don't know that I agreed with a single one of those signs. But the reason those signs were there, because at some point, somebody didn't pay attention to the sign and got themselves into trouble and they decided, well, we need to slow people down going through here. It wasn't me. I didn't do it. But because the boundary had been set based on previous bad experiences, they're now saying, look, if you want to be safe on this road, you probably ought to drive this, this speed mile limit. Part, this speed limit. And uh, yeah. I think it's the same thing there. God said, look, you guys ate from this tree. I told you not to. But now you, when you stepped over that, what's the next line you're going to step over? You know, and, and, and I need to set some boundaries and some understandings because if I don't, you know, look, have I, have I, ever, have I ever ignored one of those signs before? Eh, probably at some point. And, and nothing bad happened, thank God. But it definitely could. Mm-hmm. And eventually you push, you push that boundary far enough to where you're going, you know, I'm, I'm going double what the sign says. It's probably okay. Uh, then, then you're going to be in trouble. Yeah. And yeah. something bad could absolutely happen. Yeah. You know, uh, we, Chris talked about his dog earlier in, the, in this. Uh, we, we have our dog, and our dog is known to run away. In fact, most of the people in our town know our dog, and, and we'll bring him back when he runs away. Well, we went and bought him a shock collar, and he has an area that he's allowed to stay in so he doesn't leave our yard. And when he gets close to that, it starts beeping, and when he crosses it, it shocks him and he comes back. Well, 
you know, our, Adam and Eve eating that fruit started the boundary. And we try to push that boundary and God goes, okay, you're getting close. Okay, come back. Come, come back. Mm -hmm. Come back. You mm -hmm. need to come back to me. And it's a good reminder that, you know, yeah, Adam and Eve ate the fruit. They had one rule. But because of that, God says, look, I'm still here and I still want you. Come back. Come back to me. Well, in, in reading through Genesis chapter 3, when, when God pronounced the curses, mm -hmm. uh, the first off was, was the snake, uh, right. representative of Satan. Right. Uh, and then he, he focused his attention on Eve, and then he, he dealt with Adam. I don't believe there is any part of creation that is not spoiled because of the fall. I mean, if, if mm -hmm. you look at it, uh, God tells Eve, uh, your pains in childbirth will be greatly increased. Uh, he tells Adam, uh, "Listen, your work will become a drudgery. You will eat uh, of the of the fruit of the earth by the sweat of your brow." The the fall changed everything. So I, I don't believe there's any part. I, I honestly I believe our our DNA. I mean, because when we go back to the beginning and kind of the, the second part of the of the person's question, you know, why is all of humanity held responsible? Adam and Eve are our descendants. Yes, that's where we came from, and because of their actions, our genetic code, if you will, has been spoiled. Now death is a reality. Um, cancer is a reality. Mm -hmm. Addictions are a reality. It's, you, it, it can all be traced back yes. to Genesis chapter 3. And, and that's why all of humanity is held responsible for Adam and Eve's sin. Because their sin spoiled all of creation. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the Bible talks about, I think it's in the book of Romans, how that the creation groans even groans. to this yeah. day. Yeah. Uh, to get back to the yep. its original state, yep. which we will get to someday. And um, but it's it's called the fall of man, uh, or fall into depravity, mm -hmm. the fall into depravity, mm -hmm. and uh, a nature whereby man, even when he wants to do good, evil is before him, mm -hmm. and. Uh, He's likely to partake of that in some shape, form, or fashion. Right, and like yeah. Paul writes in Romans 7, yeah. you know, yeah. what I want to do, I don't do that. Yeah. No, I do what I don't want to do. Yeah. And yeah. then he talks about the battle that's going on inside of him. And I'm thinking, this is the Apostle Paul. Yes. This is the guy that yes. wrote most of the New Testament. Who had the I can't help it. <laughs> exactly. So yeah. that... We're, we're mm. all out of time. But thank you very much for making that point. Excellent. Well, gentlemen, it's been, it's been real. It's yeah. been real having you with us. And we certainly appreciate you and hope that uh, we've been able to help somebody today. That's so all the time we have for today. We will, of course, be back again next week with a brand new show. So stay tuned for us next time. Until then, I'm Bill Harris. Have a good day. You've been watching TV44's newest locally produced program, Life Questions. Now we'd like your feedback. What did you enjoy about this show and what would you like to see more? Perhaps you have your own questions you'd like us to pose to our panel of pastors in a future show. Submit your questions now by email to lifequestions at WTLW.com or call us with your thoughts. We're able to discuss relevant topics with local pastors right here in the TV44 studio thanks to your financial support. Now is an excellent time to make a one-time gift to TV44 or consider becoming a monthly donor. 100% of your donation stays right here at TV44 and is used to spread the family-friendly, life-changing message of Jesus Christ. Secure donations can be made online at WTLW.com, by phone, by mail, or in person. Again, share your questions for consideration for future shows or just contact us with your comments at lifequestions at WTLW.com.